That God who chose to give us a name that is above all names. It is that God that we encounter and that we experience and that we come to worship this morning. It is that God that sees beyond our limitations into the abundance of God's grace. It is that God who heals and restores. It is that God that cleanses and makes all things new. And so as we bless the name of that God this morning, we claim all of those things for ourselves. We claim them because God offers them to us. And if we, if we ask, we shall receive. So help us, O oh, living and embracing and loving one, you who we call God this morning to be amongst us and use this experience of worship to lift our spirit to join with you so that the name that is blessed on high is the name that is blessed in our lives and made manifest through us in this world this day. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for your gracious spirit. And may our praise, our worship, be a symbol of our gratitude. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you this morning. Please be seated. It is, as always, a joy to welcome you on this beautiful Sunday morning here in Los Angeles. A delight to welcome you to worship and a delight to welcome you, especially that you remembered to turn your clocks back last night. Uh, no, turn them forward last night. Uh, let's congratulate each other as we came to know the time this morning. Now, we always have an agreement in our congregation on the days when clocks either go forward or backwards. Whoever shows up at midday, we don't laugh at uh, because they forgot to turn their clocks one way or the other. So we just acknowledge it, we bless it, we thank it, and we just know that God is in the house this morning. We are just so glad that you are here with us this morning. I want to welcome you, especially if you're worshiping with us for the very first time this morning. We know that you have a choice in worshiping communities but we really are glad that you've chosen to be with us this morning. I wonder if you indulge my spirit, if indeed you're with us for the very first time today. I wonder if you would just raise your hand, keep it up for a moment so that we can see you, so that we can welcome you to worship this morning. We are indeed glad that you are here. Uh, please accept this flower and a brochure as our way of acknowledging your presence. Inside you'll find lots more information about our church and about our community. Um, and we want you to be connected with us as much as you would want to desire. But we are so glad that you are here. We also want to extend a very special welcome to our online worshipers. We have uh, folks from all over the world who worship with us every Sunday morning. Uh, we are so glad that you are with us today. Please know that you are a part of us as much as we are a part of you, and we are so happy to have you worship with us today. 
As the ushers have passed out the welcome tablets, we invite you to sign in for us this morning. Let us know that you've been present, whether this is your first Sunday or your thousandth Sunday. It's important for us to know that you are here. And for those of you who are worshiping online, we also want to hear from you. Uh, on that page that you are uh, watching right now, uh, you'll be able to sign in and let us know that you have been present. And uh, for those of us in this church, uh, knowing that this is such a vital ministry to those people around the world, if you've not visited that page on our website yet, we want to invite you to do so, uh, specifically because there are folks from around the world who bring testimony of just the effect that your ministry has on their lives wherever they are. So please do go visit it, uh, see the testimony, and just know how much you're making a difference in the lives of people around the world globally. Uh, we are so grateful that we have this opportunity to reach out beyond just the four walls of our church sanctuary. As you came in uh, this morning, you should have received your order of worship, and on the front you'll find the order of today's service. Um, inside you'll find lots more information and uh, uh, invitation to events and calendar events that we want to have you put on your calendar, so please do uh, avail yourself of all of this information. And if you don't have time to do it today, then please take this home with you. Um, and mark on your own calendars the events and ministries and programs that you would like to be connected with. Uh, we want you to be as connected with us as possible, so please do avail yourself of all of this information. Not everything that we do through the week is announced from the pulpit, um, and so it is important that you take the information that's provided to you. But we do have just a few announcements for you this morning. I'm going to do them as quickly as possible uh, because we also do have a special announcement from our moderator, uh, the Reverend Elder Dr. Nancy Wilson, this morning. So I'm going to get through these as quickly as possible. Uh, first of all, I want to remind you that Azania, our people of African descent, are meeting today directly after worship. Uh, they'll be in the Ryland Room at 12.30 approximately. Uh, so please, uh, if you're a person of African descent, um, and especially today, uh, remember that this weekend we mark the 50th anniversary of the Salem uh, crossing of the bridge um, and the, uh, the real embrace of what that meant for us. Um, you know, I'm not, a, I'm not American, and um, I try to embrace as much of our history as possible. In just a few weeks um, or a few months, I will actually be interviewed for my naturalization um, here in the United States. Uh, and I know that they're going to ask me some question that Lucia's going to have to prompt me on. So uh, um, I do want to say, though, um, if you haven't yet seen or you haven't yet read the script of President Obama's speech over this weekend, I want to encourage you to do that. It was probably the most powerful speech I've heard and read um, in quite some time, and it was just incredible uh, to see how he brought together all of the pieces of America um, and made them real for us. Um, so, regardless of our politics, it's not, this is not about being a Democrat or Republican. This is about someone who spoke extremely powerfully. Um, let's give him a place of honor and to thank him this morning. Uh, today we have four worship services. Our 9 o'clock has already happened, of course, and we're now at the 11 o'clock. Uh, there'll be a 1.30 service uh, for our folks in Spanish. And then this evening is our second Sunday creative arts evening service. Uh, that will be at 8 o'clock in the, um, uh, the, the theater in the lower level of our church building. Um, have great news for you. Uh, the uh, elevator is now up and running. Um, and uh, the downstairs is complete. So we are just... Uh, I don't know about you, but I'm excited. Uh, that's uh, almost a year in the making. We're just now waiting for the city final permit, um, but uh, we have occupancy and we can now start using the lower level. So uh, uh, we're just excited and over the moon about that. So um, if you've not been down there yet, we want to invite you to do so. March the 21st, we are having an all-church worship summit uh, from 10 till 3. If you've ever uh, wanted to be involved in worship, but you would like just a little bit of training, uh, then that's the day for you. If you want to be an acolyte or a server, uh, a reader, an usher, uh, perhaps you want to work on the soundboard or in the choir, multimedia, uh, all the ways in which we come together as a community and make worship happen. Uh, we're going to be doing training on that day. That's March the 21st. It will be split into two halves. Now, the first half will be around the uh, uh, upfront pieces of worship, and then the second half of the day will be about the technical side of worship. And all of those are important uh, to make worship as excellent as possible. So uh, please think about marking that date in your, your calendar. 
On the fifth Sunday, uh, when there is a fifth Sunday in a month, uh, we'll be having our fifth Sunday gospel service. Uh, that will be on March the 29th, which is also Palm Sunday. Um, it will be at 6.15 in the evening here in our sanctuary. And uh, Reverend Oneda Brooks uh, is coordinating and leading that worship service, so I know that you will want to become a part of that. Uh, that will be on 6.15. If you have friends um, who would like to participate in a gospel service, uh, we really want you to invite them to come and to share with us. Inside your orders of worship, you saw the Easter lily. Uh, please do make your uh, reservations as soon as possible. Uh, donations for lilies are $15 each or two for $25. Um, they can be made in honor of or in memory of. Um, and of course, they will be not only remembered in our Easter Sunday bulletin, but of course, we'll have lilies um, in the sanctuary on Easter Sunday morning. So please uh, do fill those in as quickly as possible. You know, I said last week that uh, the next two Sundays are always problematic for us. One, of course, when the clocks spring forward, um, and also next Sunday, which is LA Marathon. Uh, not marathon in services, that's today, but uh, the marathon, as far as the uh, marathon uh, that uh, is a fundraiser for our city. Please note that the route of the um, marathon goes pretty close to our building. So it really is important that you take this week not next Sunday, not rely on GPS, uh, but this week to take a look at the map and make sure that you know how to get here uh, for next Sunday. Um, that we don't want it to be an excuse to stay home, um, or, but we really do want to have you in the building. So please do take a look at the map and uh, find your way here uh, so that we can be here safely um, for our 11 o'clock service. Uh, many of the roads may actually be open by then, but we don't want to guarantee that, so please do take a look at the route. And now, uh, as I say, we do have a special announcement from our moderator, the Reverend Elder Dr. Nancy Wilson, and if you would just pay attention to the monitors for a moment, uh, then we can hear directly from her this morning. It's been the honor of my life to succeed Reverend Troy Perry, who was the founder and first moderator of Metropolitan Community Churches, and he provided a lot of wonderful guidance and as a role model for this important position in our growing and changing denomination. And I'm so grateful for his personal uh, continued support and love and for being a part of changing lives and changing history as far as the problem of community churches. The goal has to do with the spiritual and pastoral leadership of MCC Worldwide and being that spokesperson on behalf of our movement to the world in terms of our right to do ministry, in terms of our mission and vision and values, in terms of our being the voice in the Christian context, in the faith context, about what it means to reconcile sexuality and spirituality, what it means to integrate them, what it means to be all of who we are and to bring the message of God's justice and love to all people. And so, I think that's the first thing is to understand that there is that role, but also there is a job. We are the CEO of the corporation, of the nonprofit corporation, that is spread all over the globe and growing. To be moderator of FCC, you have to be able to change hats <laughs> when you are managing uh, a process or leading the governing board is different from leading the staff, the senior staff different from being a, a spokesperson, having television cameras facing you, or, or speaking out on Huffington Post, or uh, in the Washington Post, or, or speaking at a meeting in Europe, or at a gathering in Latin America, or in a church in Asia. So knowing, in a sense, where you are, having a sense of your context is a very important skill. And being able to relate to people who are very different, uh, who speak a different language, have a different cultural background, but finding the common connections that are human connections and our connections around our faith and our passion, around radically inclusive love of God that we preach. When you can find your connection with people, it, it's amazing and it really is inspiring to evolve a strategic plan for MCC that helps our churches grow, churches that are stuck at plateaus, Churches that have declined, churches that struggle to have the right leadership in place. What is the partnership between the denomination and our local churches that can really help local churches become all they're called to be in their community? It's been a joy to share with you some of my thoughts about the next moderator of Better Public Community Churches and about my own journey through this time. God bless you and 
everyone who is in the process of prayer and discernment for our denomination as we go forward. So as you can see, the nominations for the next moderator are being requested by the moderator's nominating committee. And uh, those names will then go forward to the nominating committee. Uh, they will begin then reaching out to some of those individuals uh, in order to seek application uh, for final election of the new moderator of our denomination in June of 2000, July of 2016. Um, so it's an important process that we are engaged in as a denomination and as a movement. And uh, our lay delegates have been inviting us to forums and they're going to continue to do that uh, through the months that come. But um, I just want to uh, take a moment just to honor and to thank the Reverend Elder Dr. Nancy Wilson for her incredible leadership uh, for our denomination. So now as we come to worship this morning, let's turn to one another, offer a sign of peace, a sign of blessing. God bless you, you're in the right place. So friends, one of the um, pieces that makes our denomination uh, a little different is about this holy integration of our sexuality and our spirituality. And one of the courses that we developed within our denomination is a course called Creating a Life That Matters. And many of our constituents, especially in this congregation, have done Creating a Life That Matters. And this weekend brought to the conclusion the latest incarnation of Creating a Life That Matters. And so I'm going to ask uh, Reverend Dr. Laurie Dick and uh, Jenny Nichols and Jane Sifterstead um, if they would come forward so that we can afford those certificates and you might need a microphone as well. So as those uh, candidates are coming up, uh, let's uh, thank them for taking the time to do this course and for making a difference. of service and you will see them serving they're wonderful servants of our God so we have uh, graduation certificates for these people yay okay we want to congratulate Jeff Aviles congratulations <laughs> Miss Raja Jones Mark McAllister. Charlotte Schiffer. And Tori Topjin. We want to invite you to look for the next class. We're going to be doing um, a week by week class, not a weekend format, but a week by week by week class. So you can one night a week, and we want to invite you to join us. It'll change your life, right? Yeah. Amen. Thank you so much. <laughs> the scripture reading this morning is taken from John, chapter 4, verses 1 through 30, taken from the message. Jesus realized that the Pharisees were keeping count of the baptisms that he and John performed 
although his disciples, but not Jesus, actually did the baptizing. They had posted the score that Jesus was ahead, turning him and John into rivals in the eyes of the people. So, Jude- so Jesus left the Judean countryside and went back to Galilee. To get there, he had to pass through Samaria. He came into Sychar, a Samaritan village that bordered the field that Jacob had given his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was still there. Jesus, worn out by the trip, sat down at the well. It was noontime. A woman, a Samaritan, came to draw water. Jesus said, would you give me a drink of that water? His disciples had gone to the village to buy food for lunch. The Samaritan woman, taken aback, said, asked, how come you, a Jew, are asking me, a Samaritan woman, for a drink? Jews in those days wouldn't be caught dead talking to Samaritans. And Jesus answered, if you knew the generosity of God and who I am, you'd be asking me for a drink, and I would give you fresh, living water. The woman said, sir, You don't even have a bucket to draw with, and this well is deep. So how are you going to get this living water? Are you a better man than our ancestor Jacob, who dug this well and drank from it? He and his children and livestock had passed it down to us. Jesus said, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again and again. Anyone anyone who drinks the water I give will never thirst. Not ever. The water I give will be an artisan spring within, gushing fountains of endless life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so I won't ever get thirsty. I won't ever have to come back to this well again. And he said, go, call your husband, and then come back. I have no husband, she said. That's nicely put, I have no husband. You've had five husbands, and the man you're living with now isn't even your husband. You spoke the truth there, though, sure enough. Oh, so you're a prophet? Well, tell me this. Our ancestors worshiped God at this mountain, but you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place for worship, right? Believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship God neither here at this mountain nor nor there in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark. We Jews worship in the clear light of day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews. But the time is coming. It has, in fact, come when what you're called to do will not matter and where you go to worship will not matter. It's you, it's who you are, and the way you live that count before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the the pursuit of truth. That's the kind of people God is looking out for, those who are simply honest, simply and honestly themselves before God in their worship. God is sheer being itself the spirit. Those who worship God must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves in adoration. And the woman said, I don't know about that. I do know that the Messiah is coming. And when he arrives, we'll get the whole story. I am he, said Jesus. You won't have to wait any longer or look any further. Just then his disciples came back. They were shocked. They couldn't believe he was talking to that kind of woman. No one said what they were all thinking, but their faces showed it. The woman took the hint and left. And in her confusion, she left her water pot. Back in the village, she told the people, come see a man who knew all about the things I did, who knows me inside and out. Do you think this could be the Messiah? And they went to see for themselves. Hear what the Spirit says to God today. Thanks be to God. Amen. I'm going to teach you.
teach you a new song today. And it's pretty simple. And we ask that you just listen, sing along as you can. It's called Hands to the Heavens. We are your church. We are your sons and daughters. We've gathered here to meet with you. We lift our eyes. We lay our hearts before you. Expected here for you to
So friends, as our musicians and staff and all come together, let's bring our hearts and minds together now as we ask God to bless this word this morning. Would you pray with me? God, we're so grateful for this church and for this community. We thank you for every sister and for every brother that is present, every sister, every brother who is online this morning every sister and brother who is a part of our community and may be unwell today. We ask God for your healing presence and for your grace to fill us as we open our hearts and our minds now to receive of this good news that you have for us. Fill us and set us on fire again by your Spirit, so that through that Spirit we might be set free as ambassadors into this world. Bless this word, O God, so that it might be edifying for each and every one of us. Fill us with that good news. And now, loving one, I pray that you would touch my lips of clay, mold them into the words that need to be spoken this day. And may the words that come from my mouth and the meditations on each and every one of our hearts, may they be ever acceptable to you. In the name of Jesus, the risen Christ, in whom we pray, amen. Amen. Now, for those of you who come from a more traditional uh, place in your spirituality, uh, you will probably note two things about this particular season. Uh, One, the season of Lent is not a time to be having too much fun, and also the time of Lent is not a time to have flowers on the altar. Uh, In fact, for many who come from that tradition, uh, the church should be stark and bare throughout the entire season of Lent in preparation for the adoration and the glory of Easter itself. Well, not here at Founders Metropolitan Community (laughs) Church. Uh, We've been having some great fun together over the last few weeks in this season of Lent, and because we had such an amazing time at Don and Yell's wedding yesterday, uh, we are blessed with just a plethora of flowers on the altar, and there was no way that those were going to go down uh, on this particular Sunday. So um, sometimes tradition just has to take a step aside um, so that we can continue to be the body of Christ. It really is a joy. I've had so much fun over the last few weeks as we have been thinking about what Lent means for us as a church. And Lent usually is a time of inward reflection, a time of our own deepening of our spirituality. Uh, In fact, Lent is a time when we put on the the sufferings of Christ, uh, when we remind ourselves of that Christ who went to the cross for us. It is that suffering, that suffering servant that we come to acknowledge and that we come to understand and that we come to explore in our own understanding of our own spirituality. And so in this season of Lent, we have been talking about our own spirituality. We've been reminding ourselves that there is this individual responsibility that we have to grow as people of faith, uh, to grow in our own spirituality. But in order to grow in our spirituality as a church, we've been talking about what it means to know our own spiritual locations, what it means to understand that we come at the text or we come at our experience with God or we come to our understanding of God from different places because not one of us is alike. And that all of us need to understand where our spiritual location is so that we might grow in that spirituality. And so we have been exploring what some of those spiritual locations might look like in order that we can therefore grow in that particular area of our lives. And that doesn't mean that we won't uh, be fluid around where those spiritual locations are, but where we are today. It's important that we know where we are today um, in order that we can then grow and deepen our faith experience. And so just a couple of weeks ago, we began with this wonderful compass that's on the back of our altar Uh, beginning to thinking about where our spiritual locations are. And we began by thinking about our spiritual location as a people who are searching for faith, searching for what it means to be a person of faith, searching for the truth that ultimately sets us free. 
Not, not the truth that has been experienced by somebody else, but the truth that we experience as individuals. The knowing that our truth is our truth, and that that truth is as valid as anybody else's truth. But it is the truth that we find in our own spiritual locations, and that some of us are on a quest for that truth, searching in many, many different places. Uh, our world offers us numerous places to find truth, and we also understand Jesus, the teacher who offers us the way, the truth, and the life. Uh, and so we search for that truth in our own spiritual locations and our own spiritual journeys. And there's nothing wrong with searching for truth, Amen. a truth that will ultimately set us free. And we move then to thinking about people who are constantly changing, that our world is constantly changing. And that if we are truly deepening our spirituality, then we also understand that the way that we see God is constantly changing. Through our experiences, the understanding and depth of God continues to change within us. Who we were yesterday is not who we are today. And that that changing experience is the transformation that the Holy Spirit offers to us. Indeed, if we have not changed then perhaps we need to ask ourselves, what is or what is not the Holy Spirit doing in our lives? That truly we should be a changing people and a changing experience of life through the experience of God. And this morning we come to the next part of our compass um, uh, to look at the way in which we are a people who are connecting, a people who are connecting one with the other. And, and so appropriate this morning that we should be looking at the woman in the well on this day, which is International Women's Day, uh, to raise up the voices of women. <laughs> to, to understand that, that women have been given a bad rap over the years. Uh, indeed, if you look at Scripture, women have certainly had a bad rap. In fact, there are very few women in the, both the Hebrew and the Christian Scriptures who get given names. Uh, often the women are the silent named people in Scripture. Now, we could probably name a few like Mary, uh, and we could probably think about Ruth and Naomi, uh, but often, over and over again, we see women who are left unnamed. Uh, in indeed, sometimes the names of women are left unnamed, but their significant others or the men in the Scriptures are given a name. It's that patriarchal system that we have lived under for far too long, and a patriarchal system that also breeds homophobia and racism and all of the other isms that continue to emerge amongst us. And so as a people on this International Women's Day, we give this woman voice this morning. Now, we can't give her a name, and I won't, uh, won't attempt to even give her a name, but we leave her nameless in identifying the reason why this woman is without a name, because of the patriarchy of our world. But our scripture reading is probably one that you've heard many, many times, perhaps not from the paraphrased version of the message before. And uh, I always look over at uh, Skip Chasey when the reading is being read because he usually has his Bible open and he's usually comparing word for word the ways in which it has been paraphrased or changed. And every now and again, I get a glimpse of him looking over his glasses at me. <laughs> Eugene gives us a, a different way of seeing this particular scripture. And if you've been around and you've heard this scripture on numerous occasions, you will know that there are many, many pieces of the scripture that we could draw out this morning, many, many ways in which we could understand this scripture this morning. But, but I want to give us perhaps just a, another way of looking at it this morning, a, a way that perhaps might help us to identify and to think about the ways in which we are connecting and how we connect with this God that we worship this morning. And in order to do that, we also need to know the context of this Scripture, because I'm sure that there were some pieces in the Scripture that you have thought, why on earth was that happening? Why on earth was that lifted up by the writer who wrote this particular text for us? Why is it that Jesus, that, that Jesus needed to talk about the difference between Jews and Samaritans? Why is it that Jesus needed to think about the time of the day that he was at the well? And I'm going to hope to uh, unpack some of those things for us this morning. So, so here we have Jesus and his disciples who are on the way to Galilee. 
And on the way to Galilee, they have to go through some treacherous places. Now, one of those treacherous places where the Samaritans live. And the Samaritans and the Jews did not get on well. Uh, they were a group of people who uh, understood their faith radically different. Uh, they were a group of people who weren't as pure as the Jews. Uh, they had in some ways diverted or had perhaps uh, abolished some of the rules and regulations of the Jewish faith. They were still considered people of faith, but they were the Samaritans. They were the people who were seen as the barbarians in some ways. Uh, indeed, on this road to Galilee, uh, we know that there were many instances where uh, people would get hurt on the way to their journey. It's not to say the Samaritans did it, but uh, it was a way of raising up these people as something less than the Jews. And, and so Jesus is on the way to Galilee, he's on the way through Samaria, and the disciples have gone off together. They've left Jesus on his own to fend for himself, just in case something happens. They were making sure that they were all right, and they were going off to get lunch, apparently, going off to the local store, the 7-Eleven, because it was open 24 hours, and they'd gone off to go and buy lunch so that they would bring it back to Jesus. So Jesus, because Jesus is, you know, apparently according to all the pictures I've ever seen of Jesus, you know, he's got a six-pack and he's a hunk and he's blonde and blue-eyed. Perhaps that's my image of Jesus, I don't know. <laughs> I told you I'm going to have fun in this Lenten series, but, but Jesus, big buff Jesus, is sat there by the well. So Jesus is... <laughs> Jesus is sat by the well, and Jesus is accompanied at the well by this woman. It says in Scripture that she's a Samaritan, and it also says in Scripture that it is noontime. So here is the scene of Jesus sat at the well with this woman at noontime, and he turns to the woman and he says, would you get me a drink? And the woman is shocked. Now, now, there are many reasons why this woman is shocked, none more than here is a Jew talking to a Samaritan. Here is a man talking to a woman who's on her own. And here is the woman at high noon of the day. There were many layers to this particular Scripture. Uh, in, in fact, there could have been reason for Jesus to have been seen as unclean just by talking to a woman who was a Samaritan. No less that, that this woman would then talk back to Jesus without the company of a man. It's also good reason why that is noontime. You know, there is a, a phrase uh, from my culture that says, mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. You may have heard it. Or not. <laughs> and... And the same reason applied to this woman. She should not have been at the well at noontime. It was the hottest part of the day. Indeed, there was many reasons why the women would all go together to Jacob's well. They would go in the first part of the day when it was shady, when there was no heat, when they could go and they could draw water enough for the day and return to their village in the safety of the, the, the lack of heat of the day. But this woman is on her own, at high noon, in the heat of the day. And Jesus begins to uncover why this woman is there at noontime on her own. You see, this woman had faced the oppression of the society in which she had come from. She had been pushed out, set aside, moved over. She had become ostracized by the very community in which she sought her refuge and her help. She was a woman of ill repute, even under the Samaritan system. And she was at the well on her own because she could not travel with the other women. They had pushed her out. How many of us can identify with the woman at the well this morning? We understand her pain and we understand the way in which she had been oppressed in her own society. She had been moved to the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, on her own. I can only imagine how she must have felt, although I'm sure many of us can identify the feelings of this woman in our own bodies this morning. 
we, we understand when people have pushed us aside, when people have said we don't worship in the right way, when we've been told that our faith is not the real faith, when we've been told over and over again that our story is not a valid story. We can identify with this woman at the middle of the day because many of us have felt the pain of this woman. And she sat there in the middle of the day, probably has even protected herself from all of the hurt and the pain that she has received. I think sometimes we protect ourselves from the pain and the hurt that we have received, the hurt and the pain that people have thrown at us. And, and so often that hurt and that pain doesn't open us up to this experience of the Spirit. Indeed, sometimes that hurt and pain shoves us down and separates us from this love of this God that we have been invited into. Sometimes the hurts and pains of the world around us have helped us to denigrate our own selves and our own self-worth, just like the woman at the well that day. I'm sure she felt no worth, no value. I'm, I'm sure that as she sat there thinking about all of the pain that she'd been through, of all of the things that had been said about her, whether they were true or not, that she felt completely isolated. I probably think that she may have even thought about throwing herself down the well and saying, to the end with it. I know that there are folks in this congregation this morning who have felt that much pain, that they just want to throw themselves down the well. So Jesus is there, and he's going to cut through some of the, the BS. He's going to cut through some of the pain He's going to cut through some of the social stratas. He's going to cut through some of the stuff that has hurt this woman time after time after time. And here he is, a good Jew, now speaking to this woman. And later on in the conversation, after she has encountered Jesus, he tells her to go back to the village and find her husband and bring him over. Oh, my goodness gracious me. She thought everything was going just fine up until that point. She thought she'd got a friend. She thought that she had found someone that she could at least begin to talk to, to begin to unload some of her burdens on, to think about this living water that was being offered to her. And then in the brisk moment, Jesus then says something that once again she could have shut down and made up any kind of lie just to have got over it. She could have just said to Jesus, okay, I'll be back in an hour or so. I'll go and find a husband. <laughs> Some of us have said exactly those same things. Some of us have said we're going to find a wife too, but uh, you know, I'm going to. So, so, but no, she's honest. She's honest. She says to Jesus, I, I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, You're absolutely right. You don't have a husband. In fact, you've had several husbands. Some of us can identify with that as well this morning. <laughs> And the one you're living with isn't even your husband at all. Many of us can identify with that as well. Do a great line in weddings if anyone wants to know. You see, Jesus met her at her place of need. He met her at her place of need. He met her in the place of suffering. She had nothing left to lose. She'd already been kicked aside. She'd already been told that she was, and you can fill in the blanks. She had nothing left to lose. And she sat there in the honesty of the heat of the day and laid it right out there. You know, friends, sometimes we just need to sit with Jesus and lay it right out there. To, to just tell Jesus who we are to let Jesus feel the pain of who we are and where we have come from. Because it is in acknowledging that pain and that suffering that Jesus is able to enter in and to begin to connect us once again with the feelings of our bodies, with the lives that we desire, and with the fulfillment of the passion of Jesus that wants to make all things new over and over again. 
But it begins when we start to connect or perhaps to reconnect with this God of our higher power, this God of our understanding, this God of liberation who wants us just to lay it right out there. Not to paint the, pity, the pretty picture. Oh, we're good at painting pity pictures. <laughs> But to, not to, to, but to lay it out there so that Jesus can see just what's going on in our lives. If we think we can run and hide from God, we can't. But God does ask us in our own personal responsibility to lay it out there so that at least Jesus and us can understand what's going on in our lives, what's happening to who we are. What excites me about this Scripture is not just that encountered with Jesus, but what happened next. You see, when, he, when she had an encounter with Jesus, she could not contain the passion of the transformation that happened in her life. It, it says that she ran back to the town with the village where she came from, and she ran amongst all those women who had kicked her, who had abused her, who had told her she was worthless, who had done all to ostracize her from her community. And she ran right into the middle of them, even the middle of the lion's den. And she said, come with me and find the man who just told me everything about me. Come and find this Messiah that we have been searching for. Come and hear, come and see, come and feel, come and touch. You see, she was on fire for what Jesus had just done for her in her life. And we're invited this morning to align our lives with that Jesus who comes to connect us once again with being on fire for the passion of this gospel of good news and liberation and healing that sets us free. That's what we're offered this morning. When you've had an encounter with Jesus, you can't keep it to yourself. You have to go out into the world and make it real. You have to go out into the world and tell the world about the transforming power, the transforming presence of God that made you who you are today. That's the transformation. That's the connectedness that we are invited to in the name of Jesus. The connectedness with one another, the connectedness with the good news, the connectedness that reminds us that we are worthy of God's love. That no matter what mothers may have told us, no matter what people may say about us, we are connected to a higher power, a God who wants only the very best for us, that wants us to be honest, that wants us to tell our truth and then get the transformation that we desire. That's the liberation. That's the connectedness that God invites us into this morning the connectedness, that when you've had an experience of transformation, you can't keep it to yourself. Many of you have seen a photographer walking around the building this morning, and she's allowed to take pictures of anybody who's up front and of the person who is the main culprit for having the photographer here this morning, and that's Corrie Saucier. So Corrie is being featured in, a news, in, a, in a, an article in the not-too-distant future in one of the magazines here in Los Angeles. And he told his story about this church and the holy integration of his sexuality and his spirituality. And they decided that they want to feature his life and feature the place that gave that gift to him. That's, that's, that's what happens. You see, you see when, you're, when you're connected... When you're connected to this God of hope, when you're connected to this God of transformation, when you're connected to a God who has changed your life, you can't keep it to yourself. You have to run back to your village and tell the women. You have to run back to the church and tell the church that hurt you, I've been set free. You have to run back to the people who once told you you weren't good enough and say, I am a child of the living God who loves me just the way that I am. You have to run into the world. That's what happened for the woman at the well that day. Now, there are many, many other things that happened for her, but she couldn't keep the good news to herself. No longer did she want to throw herself down the well. She wanted to throw herself into the world to make a difference, to transform this world and her experience based on that meeting with Jesus. Is that what our worship does on Sunday? 
Does it reconnect us with ourselves and with God in a way that we can't keep this good news to ourselves? That we can't keep it to ourselves? That we must go back out into the world and connect the dots one with the other? To connect it in such a way that it makes a difference. On this International Women's Day, we align ourselves with women of faith who have not kept the story to themselves. We connect our lives with women of faith who have struggled in a patriarchal system. We connect ourselves with women of faith who, regardless of whether they were given a name or not, they continued to tell their story and to tell their truth. The women who have weaved their lives amongst us and who have given us liberation. In the Hunter Room, we have this wonderful cork board that invites you to tell the stories of women who have weaved their lives in such a way that we have been set free. I can't tell you the numbers of women in my life who have given me faith and have given me hope, many of which I could name and many that I could not. But the women of our lives have weaved their stories amongst us, named and unnamed and have often been the pioneers of liberation and setting people free, connecting us to God once again. If you and I are at a place this morning where you feel disconnected, where you feel as if you're not connected to this source of the power of God, I want you to hear this story of the woman at the well who met with Jesus that day and whose life was transformed in such a powerful way that she had to run back to the devil's, the deepest vine, the viper's place, and say, I met a man who knew everything about me, and he didn't judge me. He didn't condemn me. He didn't tell me, well, I don't want to hear any more because you're going to hell anyway. <laughs> who didn't say, you're worthless who didn't say, you're not a child of God, but who gave her the gift of living water, of water that she would quench her thirst on, not water that she would have not to come back and, and, and find again because we all need water, but it was a living water, a living well that's now within each and every one of us that we can tap into at any time and find our liberation and our hope. It is that connectedness that we get to receive this morning, all because a woman at the well decided to talk back to Jesus when she should not have spoken in the first place. Thank God for women who speak back over and over again, <laughs> even when we're told that they shouldn't. And beyond that, thank God for African Americans. Thank God for God's LGBT community. God, thank God for people who have stepped out of a tradition that for one reason or another told them that God didn't love them and took the courage to find out for themselves. May we stand in alignment one with the other knowing that we are better together, stronger together, when we reach out our hands and connect one with the other. And so it is. Let us pray. God, we honor you. God, we thank you. God, we stand with the woman in the story this morning thanking you that we can see ourselves in that story, sat at that well that day as you offered living water. Help us this morning if we have felt disconnected. Help us this morning if we want to get reconnected to drink of that water that you offer us, a water of liberation, a water of good news, a water that knows our story and loves us just as we are a story that gets to meet us at our point of need today. And in that point of need says, Sister, brother, rise up.
catch the fire one more time, sense the spirit within you, reawakening you to the possibilities of what God is able to do when you say yes to the spirit's anointing in your life. And through that transformation, we cannot keep silent, but run into the world, into the places that perhaps have not welcomed us, and say, come, meet a man, meet someone I know who offered me living water this day. Now, God, I pray that you would take the words that have come from my mouth and allow them to return to you without blessing us, without reminding us of our worth and our value and helping us to wholly integrate every aspect of our lives as they are divinely made in your very image. To the honor and glory of the one that we acknowledge this morning, God. Amen. Je t'aime, t'aime Ya tibia blue blue Ani o hevo tcha I love you The sounds are all as different As the lands from which they came And though our words are all unique Our hearts are still the same Love in any language Straight from the heart Holds us all together Never apart And once we learn to speak it All the world will hear Love in any language Fluently spoken This church connects with all of us in this building. It connects with people all over the world every single day, from 12-step groups to support groups to church functions. We need all of your help to make that happen. Your time, your talents, and your tithes. Please give as you're able.
Will you pray with me? Ever-present God, please take these blessings that we were able to give and put them to use in the way in which that you see fit. May they multiply and multiply and multiply and connect all over the world with all that we are able to do. To God be the glory. Amen. For just such a time as this, we are here in this place, and we are here to give voice to those who have no voice. So let us go to God in prayer. God, we give thanks for all of your creation, for all those you've created, from the little ones to those who walk upon the earth, those who swim in the seas, those who live in fresh water, and those who continue to scratch out an existence in this world. God, today, you know who we are. You know where we are. Help us to relinquish our protectiveness, our walls that we have built up, to be one with you today. We surrender ourselves into your care. We're grateful to receive all of your love and let it sink deep into our bones all the way through helping us to lift up our hearts and speak and share our joy and the love that we feel for each other and for you. And share that with everyone who is in need today. So God, you know those who are in need. You know those who are imprisoned for good reasons, for bad reasons. You know those who are in hospital, those who are not able to get up off the floor or out of their bed. God, you know those who are hungry those who have no place to live, those who were born 
and have no one to raise them. God, we give you all those who are in need in this planet. God, you know where there are people still choosing war as a way to be powerful rather than choosing peace and coming together and being connected in love and supporting all around them. And God, especially we pray for those who have been resigned from having any voice for centuries in their cultures. We lift up moments in our lives, moments in their lives. We ask that you would be with the women who still struggle to feed their families and to keep their children safe. God, be with the men who are looking for meaningful work, who are looking for places to bring themselves to who they know they can be. God, be with all of those who have been silenced, all of those for whom it is not safe to speak their own names. God, we give them all to you, especially those who are feeling so lost and lonely that they think this might be the day to take their own lives. So God, be with them now, we ask in their name. Save them now. Wrap them in your love and hold them close. We ask all this in your precious name. Amen. 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 Just as Jesus met that woman at the well, Today, we open this altar unto you because that same Jesus is right there at the well, standing there for those who have been rejected, for those who are thirsty, for those who feel that they have no place in the presence of God's children. Jesus stands there as he's with his friends in that upper room. And he takes bread. He lifts it up to his parent in heaven. And he gives thanks for it. Then he breaks it. And he offers it to those who are sitting at the table with him. He said, this is my body that is broken for you. And as you eat it, remember me. And in like manner, Jesus took the cup. He lifted it up to his parent and he gave thanks again. He said, this is my blood. It will be shared for you and for many. And as you drink it, it's for the forgiveness of your sin. There's nothing you can do to keep you separated from me. I'm taking care of it. You can stand up here as a woman today and offer the sacraments, the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior. I can stand up here as an African American today Believing and knowing that I have a soul, that I, my thirst can be quenched. I can stand here as that woman did at the well, coming in the, at the heat of the day, very heat of the day, feeling there is less traffic in an integrated church. <coughs> where that I might be the least in color and be loved and feel that love. If you feel this is your first time gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, black, white, Latino, whomever that you might be, if you feel there is no place for you in God's dominion, in God's arms, at God's will. The connecting is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He died for you. He shed his blood for you. 
He loves you. In this time, if you're willing, would you reach out and help to bless and consecrate these, the gifts that Jesus left for us? Hallelujah. God, we thank you. Thank you. From the bottoms of our heart. Thank you. God. We lift up our whole beings and thank open you. ourselves to receive from you yes. these great gifts. The gifts of bread, of juice, the gifts of body and blood. Yes. We give ourselves into your care and all those who are your people, all of those who are in need. Yes. We ask that we would receive you in as you have left this table prepared for us. We thank you in your many precious names. Amen. Amen. It's our time to receive this sacrament of communion. Yes. And you will be directed by the ushers. You can receive at four stations along this area. There's one station at the small altar on the side where you can talk to God for yourself and you can take the elements yourself. And y'all up there, I know you were able to walk up there, so I know you're able to walk down. So come on down. <laughs> yep. So we're gonna serve you down here and we expect y'all to come on down. <laughs> so let us all follow the direction of the ushers and come and receive God where you are.
So my prayer is that as we have been in God's presence this morning, Amen. that we have found that transformation that means that we have to go into the world and yes. share this good news, this liberating hope of the connectedness that we have with the God that we know. Amen. Amen. Let's close worship in song. And now unto God's gracious mercy and protection each and every one of us is given. And the blessing of God, known to us as Creator, Savior, and Holy Spirit, be with us and remain with us now and evermore. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. participating with us online, you are an extension of this church's membership ministry, our extended fellowship. Whether you're tuning in from Los Angeles, London, Tokyo, or Zimbabwe, wherever you are in the world, we are so excited to embrace you, to hear from you, and to pray for you. All of the people you've just seen in this broadcast, not just the ministers and the choir, but every person sitting on those pews, we are here for you. So please, why don't you connect with us? interact with us. We have four ways you can do that. Telephone, email, Facebook, and Twitter. And all of those links are located at the bottom of every webpage of our website at mccla.org.
your help. We can not just continue, but expand and reach a greater number of people with God's love through this ministry. Be a video angel amongst us by supporting this ministry through our donate link located just under the support menu in the upper right corner of any page of our website. Your participation is very important. And I want to invite you to write to me and let me know how I can be in prayer and praise with you. Even though you are not here in our worship centre, you are still a part of MCCLA. Email me directly at revneal at mccla.org. May God bless your life. And I look forward to welcoming you back many, many times to MCC.